All right, we got a bigger rock. Now that's what I'm talking about. And look at this tiny single drum hoist. I think I found it. I think I found it. Oh, it definitely keeps going. <sighs> Holy cow. Ooh, I got a special treat for you guys today. Not only am I gonna be showing you one of my favorite spots to find gold, but I'm also gonna be giving away a whole bunch of silver bars. Oh, yeah. So you watch to the end of this video, find out how you can get your hands on those silver bars. All different sizes too. Look at this. Do you think that this stall is really holding much of this up? I could kick that with my foot and this would all fall in, guaranteed. Nice. Ooh, we gotta explore it, huh? It's the problem with altered andesite, especially if it's been fractured, it's just, look, how weak that is. And then in the middle, you can dig the fault gouge out. You can see all the rocks and bits in between where those two fault planes have been grinding together to create that. You can see fragments that have been locked up in there too. You see that? This would be a good place to sample to check for values. And if you find fault gouge out there, I want you to sample it too. A lot of times it can have trace amounts of gold inside that fault gouge. Now it's time to head northwest to the massive dredge piles just north of Dayton. The world's largest dragline dredge, the California-based Dayton Dredging Company, went to work west of Dayton. The Nevada State Journal reported that the dragline dredge would tear up 20,000 tons of earth daily. Oh, my name's Kyle Bowers and I'm about finding gold. Yeah, okay, so we're out here showing the dredge piles. He pulls up and says, hey, I know you. I'm like, oh, from the post office? No, because he's been finding gold. Tell him what you've been doing. Oh, I've been running the little $40 sluice and pulling out little little pieces of gold, little nuggets. Isn't that cool? And I've been telling everybody, now's the perfect time with all that record rain and snow and everything's uh, pushing everything down. He's finding gold. He's never found gold before, ain't that right? No, it's the first place. And he just put in a little tiny sluice, starts feeding it, boom, gold. That's what you should be doing. Get off that couch, stop eating the chip and drinking the beer. Get up here into these mountains because now is once in a lifetime because there's just rain and water everywhere. Ain't that right? Absolutely. You got anything to add? You got any shout outs? Just Jeff Williams. Yeah. He's one yeah. Appreciate you stopping by and telling us your story. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Thank you. Ooh, what'd you find, sweetie? Huh? Ooh. Ooh, look how soft this collar is. Oh, that's the problem with the mines here in the Virginia City area is the collars are very soft. This almost looks like an escapeway, huh, sweetie? Yes. You can see where the windlass was right here going across. Of course, the first thing to go is a windlass, so they take that out first, but you can see where they did the hand crank on the windlass. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's pigeons. Look at all this rounded river rock. You see it? And there's a big monker right there. Now what this is, is a gigantic sample cut. They dug out a huge trench, which cuts across the old river channels that were flowing down off the mountains millions of years ago. But I see perfect spots up there to sample from, because it takes a lot of water to move rocks that big. So that's where we're gonna sample. We'll see what we got. And that's what you should be doing too, if you see any of these old cuts from days gone by, and you isolate the contact zones. It'll be obvious. I can see three contact zones right here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sample at the contact zones and then we're gonna pan it out and see if we got anything. I don't know if you can see it. I've got a contact zone right there where that big rock is sitting. There's a contact zone. You see all the large rocks sitting right there, right along that plane, that bedding plane. The smaller stuff is down here below it. And then you got some cobbles and then at the very top, you got another contact zone right about there. So I'm more interested in this one because it looks like it took a lot of water to move that. So I'm gonna get in there and sample what I can. A lot of altered andesite, a lot of basalt, all kinds of goodies in here. Right there. <sighs> Big old piece of magnetite. Look at the size of that monker. Man, that's heavy too. Wow. That's huge. It's a monster. All right, we'll take this and pan it because there's water holes everywhere out here. But I'm going to show you the tailing piles that were left behind from the massive trommels they were running out here because it's just mind boggling how much material they ran out here to get that gold. Look at this, this is all tailing piles from trommels that are running out here. These are massive piles and they go on for miles. Look at this, isn't this something? These are all tailing piles from when they were running trommels out here. Just absolutely amazing.
I'm gonna say, right? And yeah, you're gonna get wet. Ugh, nasty. All right, remember what I taught you. You wanna knead that material up in case there's any clay in there. Stratify, get the heavies to drop to the bottom. Rake the rocks to the back if you don't have a classifier. Like that. If there's any gold, then the heavies will be at the front. Rake those rocks to the back. Look at that. Beautiful. All right. Let's see if my hole's deep enough. No jokes, I know what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Nugget! <laughs> All right, let's see what we got. I got plenty of black sand. I got plenty of black sand. All right. Try to get that shadow off of it for you. Look at that. Yeah, there's another. Oh, that's a big one. I'll get snapshots of this, but there's little tiny, tiny pieces in there. What I'm going to do is I'll put a snapshot of this up because I can't get the GoPro down close enough without creating a shadow. So I'll get you some snapshots. It's really, really fine. There's about 20 little tiny pieces in there, but there is gold in that contact zone. So we're gonna work our way around up through these little washes and streams, see if we can find some more gold. But I'm not gonna do nothing until you smash that like button, smash it hard, or I'm just gonna sit here and drink this water. What do you think about that? All right, come on, let's go. By the spring of 1851, some 200 placer miners, including James Old Virginia Finney, were working in this area. The continuous occupation of Gold Canyon's mouth all the way up to the canyon makes this site Nevada's first non-Native American settlement. Dayton, also known as Chinatown, became a mineral milling, commercial, and agricultural center after prospectors and placer miners worked their way all the way up Gold Creek. In January of 1859, a rich discovery was made at the very head of Gold Canyon, which you're looking at now by James Fenimore and Henry T.P. Comstock, which gave the name to the Comstock load and started the town of Gold Hill. Here you're looking at downstream Gold Canyon as it filters all the way down to the dredge piles and of course into Dayton. A lot of gold can still be found in this area, but unfortunately, most of it has been claimed up by the Comstock Mining Company, LLC. So if you do decide to go prospecting here, Please check land status first before coming out here. But do keep in mind, there is plenty of gold still left behind. Ooh, this looks like a really good spot. Look at this. Nice, and you got water too? Oh, I see a gravel bar. See that gravel bar right there? Water's come down here, deposited. Slowly having to work away that way and then around. He's just hanging out out here, enjoying himself. Now, when you're sampling these gravel bars, always look for the bigger rocks, okay? Don't sample in flow sand. Remember, small rocks, small gold, big rocks, big gold. When sampling a gravel bar, always sample from the bench outward, looking for where potential pay layers can be. I don't know if you can see it, but it's right there. Right there. And I'll put up a snapshot of it at the end of the video. There is gold here, but you gotta work your hiney. Where's that banjo? And I know that banjo's out here somewhere.
Now we were given exclusive permission to go inside the Donovan Mill. They have all kinds of working equipment and yes, the mill is still functional. It's one of the only surviving mills here in Silver City that still works. It's actually piles of ore still waiting in the ore bins. If you ever find these old mortar boxes like this, what you wanna do is you wanna get it down inside. Be careful so the stamps don't come down and crush it. What you wanna do is you wanna try to clean that out. If they abandon it, there could be free mill gold down in the bottom. Not saying there will be, but this is a good place to check is in these old mortar boxes. What I was just told is a gentleman got his hand too close to this thing. The darn stamp dropped, took his finger, turned it into a pancake. They had to amputate it. Ooh, it's nasty. So be careful. Like I said, you're cleaning these things out. This thing weighs a thousand pounds at least. You don't want to get it between the shoe and the die, okay? In case you didn't know, this is how you start and stop these stamp mills. This is a big old bull wheel is running. Cam is spinning is you have to time it just right. And you gotta pull these, these blocks out and that way it'll let this huge stamp drop down onto that cam and the timing will be perfect. If you don't do it right, man, it's gonna hit that cam. You might break something. And that's how you get them to stop too. As they're going up and down, chonka, chonka, chonka. As it goes up and starts to come down, you get that monker in there just right. And the reason why you'd wanna do that is because when you go to clean it out, you gotta have all the stamps up so you can get into that mortar box. If you're not familiar with this, this is the Yellow Jacket Mine. In 1869, April 7, 35 miners lost their lives down below due to a fire that happened early in the morning. They're not exactly sure what happened, but they suspect that some of the electrical wiring caught fire because they used to use fabric insulators on the wiring. And that spread to some timbers. Now, another theory is that a lantern tipped over and caught one of the timbers on fire. Regardless of what happened, 35 miners did lose their lives down in this shaft. You can see that they've actually sprayed concrete, like shotcrete around it. The reason why is because they were worried that the head frame would catch fire because the fire had burned for so long they had a heck of a time putting it out. So that's why you see that coated with the concrete. This is the original Yellow Jacket Mine and just to the east they sunk another shaft called the Yellow Jacket East. And we'll go out there and see that in just a minute. Now I'm going to show you something that most people don't know. Come here, take a look at this. If you look at really old photographs, you'll see that this is a portal to the workings of the mine. The 
It goes in and it connects to a whole series of underground workings that connects to this one. As you can see, they didn't want anybody in here, so they plugged it up. And they plugged it up really, really well. But this is one of the old original entrances into the mine. And if you look right here, see the track? You can see this original track from the 1870s in the photographs. And it goes in, and like I said, it connects. Now, after the fire, they they sealed this one up and they sunk another shaft up on the hill. And I'll show you that here in a minute. Now, an interesting side note about this particular area is that it's noted to be haunted. Now, I don't know if it's from the miners who lost their lives down below or not, but people who stay in these cabins, which you can rent, swear that there's hauntings going on here all the time. And there's plenty of videos on YouTube where people have actually seen things and heard things. And you can hear machinery running at night. But I wanted you to see this particular head frame because this was one of the key instrumental reasons why the Sutro Tunnel was dug, to create ventilation in the mines and an alternate way to get out. Now it's hard to believe that there's a shaft here that goes down 3,000 feet, but there is. And the way that they plugged it is they took old cars and they shoved it into the shaft and then they put dirt over the top of it. On April 7th, 1869, a careless miner left a candle burning on the wall of a timber some 900 feet deep in the mine, which eventually set fire to supporting timbers. This blaze started a chain reaction of disasters. One of the miners, Dunleavy, who was working on the 900 foot level at the time, was alerted to the catastrophe when he heard the distinctive crashing of falling rock. Debris filled the tunnels, forcing choking gas and dust into the yellow jacket and neighboring mines. Debris filled the tunnels, forcing choking gases and dust into the yellow jacket and neighboring Kentuck shafts. While running along the 900 foot level, Dunleavy spotted a wall of flame. As he raced toward the main shaft, he gave the signal for fire, but the crackling of the burning pine timbers was so loud that his warning shouts were drowned out. Through all the craziness, he heard the screams of miners on the levels below. Air pouring in through the Kentuck mine acted like a giant bellows and fanned the flames, and he began to choke on the fumes and dust. The roof collapsed around Dunley. He lay on the floor and pulled a heavy overcoat over himself. This act helped save his life. He was the sole survivor of the nine miners on the 900-foot level. He slipped into unconsciousness and did not awaken until hours after he had been rescued. Miners risked their lives to save their co-workers, trying to rescue as many men as possible. They yanked the unconscious Dunley from the jaws of death. Later, when a cage filled with rescuers was descending past the 800 foot level, it was rocked by an explosion. The fire quickly spread to another neighboring shaft, the Crown Point Mine. The morning was filled with stories of heroism and tragedy. Many miners had to be left behind as the crowded cages were too full to pull them out. Some miners jumped to their deaths rather than suffocate or be burned alive. One man hanging on the cage had his head and arm removed by jagged timbers. Fighting the flames took weeks, and 70 miners reportedly perished fighting these flames. Many of the bodies remained in the deep where they had fallen, and Dunnevely was saved by his own quick thinking and by his brother miners. Everything's still intact for the most part. I mean, some stuff has been taken out of here, but you got just about everything intact here. Wow. And of course the main shaft is right there. We're sitting on top of the main shaft and I got an open stope. See this right here? That's an open stope. Ooh, maybe we can get inside, huh, sweetie? What are you doing? Poking your head through that little window. <laughs> and you see all the breaker boxes here? These are the old style breaker boxes. And of course, Looks like somebody was trying to harvest the copper. I don't know why they do that. Ooh, that just grabs my gears to see when people tear these old Westinghouse electric motors apart just to get a few dollars worth of copper. 
I mean, come on. That thing's over 100 years old and you tore it apart for what, 50 bucks? Wow, look at this. This is amazing. I really thought they had something bigger in here. This is absolutely amazing. And you can still smell that old oil in here too. It smells almost like creosote. All right, now I'm gonna show you what the controls do over here. Well, what's left of them. And man, I can't believe how small that single drum hoist is. I thought for sure it'd be a lot bigger than that. Cause that head frame is massive. It's a monster. All right, now you see this thing right here? This right here is part of the clutch. It's part of this system right here. And it's part of this. So when we pull on this lever, this is gonna push forward. Do you see that? And as it does so, it's gonna torque on this band. When that band torques on it, it's gonna connect the inner and outer ring together. So this is your clutch mechanism. And you can see where they put shims in here too. You see that? All right, so this guy comes over to here. Then he connects over to this jack shaft. This is the brake here, which would have been connected to this guy, which goes over here to this brake band. You see that brake band right there? It goes along the top. That's your brake band, and it connects to this guy. This is your clutch. And you can see where this used to be connected to him, but he's not connected. So that's all you really need. And this is your variable speed controller. There'd be a little knob right here. You can go forward and reverse, very important. And that would dictate the speed based on this, these breakers right here. And somewhere in here, oh, there it is, it's over there. And there's your resistor grid right there. Uh, that's where all the energy that comes off of this guy goes when it's going backwards. These things can get red hot. And this is a little tiny one. Your depth gauge would have been right there. It'd have a big dial indicator right there to tell you your depth. Now, most time there'd be a seat here for the operator to sit down because you know, he's not gonna stand up all day. And he'd wait for the bell. Usually the bell would be over there. I can see the pulley on the wall. I don't see the skip card. That's nice. That head frame. Ooh, he's listing pretty hard. Look at that. See the little pulley right here? They probably would have had a cable here for the bell. The bell was probably back here somewhere. Oh, you can see where the shaft is collapsing underneath the building. You see that? All oh, this is falling in. Oh, and that's one of the stopes right there too. Ooh, almost looks like they had a chute right here. You see that? To feed down into here. Maybe they did so they can get it up into, into that chute. And then of course there's the Crown Point Mill down there too. It's an old tie spike. Yeah, a little baby one. That's pretty cool. Ooh, they got some good looking ore around here too. See that? Mm -mm -mm. There's the main shaft. Oh, that's nasty. Yeah, you can see how soft that rock is. That's not even solid. Look at that. Eventually all of this is gonna come down onto that. There's your water and your air lines going down in there. See where they have them insulated? Because it gets bone cold out here in the winter time. See how they dumped that skip car riding up the track? As it went up, the front would dip, the outer wheels would catch that outer rail and it would dump. And then when it dumped down, if it kept going up, the front wheels would catch that, that other set of rails to make it push forward completely. Pretty cool, huh? And then they just release it and it would come back down and the front wheels would ride on that this inner rail and it would be back into position oh yeah look at that you see that all that timbering is gone it's just completely collapsed everything you can't even squeeze it well you might be able to squeeze into that now you can see where it just, it's all completely filled in because it's so soft. When you're out in the field and you find these ore bins, especially these large production mines, look at the ore bins. See if there's any ore left that's stuffed inside of them. Because chances are they never finished processing it. You can go through and look for high grade specimens. Now I'm not saying it's going to be in there every time, but it's always a good place to look. And you can take soil samples in there and pan it out to see if there's any free mill loose gold in there, fine gold that's come off a lot of this rock. So we're going to go ahead and bring some material and see if there's any gold in it. This is all beautiful stock works of quartz in here. Got some of the wall rock in there. Look at the mineralization in that one. Oh, that's beautiful. This is a nice one right here. I'll take that one. 
Yeah, we'll gather up some samples and see what's in it. Now you know what these gates are when you see them on ore chutes. They're called chute gates. You have one here and you have one here. Makes it so much easier to control the flow. Where's the old man at? There he is. Hey, how you doing? Hey, old man, how the heck are you? Good, man, good. You guys doing okay? All right. That is where the Cornish pump sat. Actually the flywheel and part of the arm. Uh, main shaft was here, of course it's been filled in. And the hoisting works are right there. They came through and they bulldozed this shut. Why? Because it goes down 3,000 feet, that's why. And the main hoist was sitting here and of course the compressor sat over here. And just look at the scale 
of the bolts that they're using. You can see that they were using saws to cut some of this. See how smooth that is? You see where the teeth were hitting here? And they were cutting it with saw and they were using feathers and wedges too. It's amazing the amount of infrastructure that they had to build to drop a shaft 3,000 feet to support the Yellow Jacket West shaft. And of course you guys are familiar with the fire that they had. That was one of the reasons why they were promoting the Sutro Tunnel so much is to create ventilation. And they had to drill the holes so they could run these bolts through and the bolts would hold this entire mass together. And of course you know that during the war, World War II, a lot of the scrappers came through and they took a lot of this equipment, all those cast iron, everything. They just cut off as much as they could for the war effort because they got paid by the pound. That's why there's hardly anything left anymore because the scrappers came through. You Imagine what this would have looked like if nobody had touched it. Look at this channel that they cut in the rock. I'm not 100% sure what this is channel is used for, if it was for water diversion or what. Here's where they're using feathers and wedges, see that? They cut that, but look where they, look where they put that channel at. All the way around, I think that's for water diversion. And look at these shims, big old metal shims they put in here to balance out this rock on top of the base rock. And it all had to be bolted together. Look at the size of this thing. It's a monster. Oh, look at all the holes in the rock. I wonder what that was for. Jeez, imagine the huge hoisting works that sat here. I know, I know, enough jaw jacking. Get on to finding us a way into that mine, Jeff. I can hear it from here. A whole bunch of flat cable that they were using that was very prominent here in the Virginia City Mines. And there, there it is. Can you see it? That is the other opening. They tried to hide it and plug it with bushes, but we're gonna go take a look. Here's some more of that flat steel cable. See it? This is what they were using to hoist up with. Look at that. They liked it because it was stronger and it wouldn't twist. There's just another innovation that they did here on the Comstock load. So many new technologies were developed specifically for this mining district because they encountered so many unusual environments. They had to invent square set timbering because of the huge stopes in the very soft ground. They had to bring out Cornish pumps to handle the millions of gallons of water that had to be removed daily. They came up with flat cable because round cable at those depths would have too much twist to it and it wouldn't have as much strength. So many different things. This was the mecca of mining. So I'm gonna get on down there and I'm gonna see if I can stick my head in there and see if it does connect because that's the rumor. And I'll tell you what, there's nothing dicier than going down mine dump, especially if they got sulfides in them, because they can get hard and you go for a ride. <laughs> I like that one. I think I found it. I think I found it. Oh, I think I found it. <sighs> Look at this. Look at this. Somebody didn't want me in here. And there's a cable going into it. I don't think I'm gonna be able to get into this one, so we're gonna head back up.
the size of this monker. BLM spared no expense putting this in. Holy cow. Look at that. It's a gargantuous structure they built as a plug. And they did a really good job. I'm gonna have to hire them. <laughs> Just look at this thing. Wow. Man, the construction on this is fantastic. Look at the size of those nuts. <laughs> Woo, there's the hoisting works there. Cut out of this andesite. You see this andesite? Quarried right out of there. Look at the size. There's my hand for size comparison. Look at that. Jeez. Man, this thing is a monster. And look at the beautiful craftsmanship on this. Wow, you got to hand it to BLM. I'm truly impressed on this structure. I really am. Now, I usually don't commend BLM on putting these gates over the top of these shafts, but if you're watching BLM, you guys did a really good job on this one. I mean, I am impressed. Phenomenal. I just can't imagine how much money you guys dumped into this thing. Beautiful archwork here. The railing that goes across. The chain work. It's just, it's incredible. It really is. And for good reason too. Because the hole that's underneath me, that monker goes down a long ways. I'll do a, I'll do a rock test so you guys can hear this. But this thing looks like it goes down a good, I don't know, I want to say about 2,000, 2,500 feet based on just the mine dump that I'm seeing here. All right, I'm going to do a rock test so we can hear what's inside. I don't know if you can see that. Probably not. Man, that goes, that really, that's just a straight, straight shot into nothing. It's like standing <laughs> over the top of the Grand Canyon. All right, let me get a rock, throw it in there. All right, we got a bigger rock. Let's see if I can get some noise all right Shh. ready mm. now there's a plug man this thing is massive it's a monster what the heck is that i didn't call the fire department hey where's the fire at <laughs> Oh, what are you guys doing out here? Having fun? Yeah, just hanging out. I asked for a pizza and look what they sent me. <laughs> I don't believe it. These guys are out exploring, having fun just like we are, and they want to learn as much as anybody else. So, you know, I got to give them credit. But you know what? They told me they know something and they want to tell me, so we're all going to say it together. So you know what I'm going to say, right? So come on! Let's go! We were out cruising around looking for more places to find mineralization and look who we ran into. What's your name and what this all about? Tom Bledsoe, I'm out riding dirt bikes out in the wild west out here, living on the road, loving America and uh, watching your guys' channel. And it got me into gold mine, not gold mining, but learning about mines. Had it not been for your channel, I wouldn't have cared less. Wow. It's amazing. I, I gotta ask, what was the video that, that you saw that got your attention? Was it Golden Home Depot sand? <laughs> no, no, no. Everybody loves that I have video. watched that one. You know, I really don't remember. It's been so long. Had to be a drift mine video. Everybody loves a drift mine. Uh, but there was the slim. Yeah. It was in. It was in there. And it's just your humor. Uh, you know, and your personality. What am I funny or something? And, huh? and then when I heard your, you know, you know a lot, or you're, are a geologist, I thought that's amazing. Now I watched several other channels, and then your, but you're going in the mines, old mines. That's the best. Oh, I love going into mines and I like taking you guys with us too and teaching you geology. So I hope you're learning something on this video. I'm doing my best. If you don't find gold after watching my videos, uh, you take up the crochet or knit needle or you something like that. You won't that. build if you just can't find it if you can't find it after watching yours. It's I love to hear that. So anyway, we're going to get out and start exploring. Like, And I saw him. I'm like, hey, I see a motorcycle. I'm going to see if I can go riding with this guy. Come on back. Yeah, no. So come on. Let's, Let's go. go.
That yellow material is referred to as propylite. It's basically altered andesite. And a lot of the ore was actually nestled inside of that. Now there was no rhyme or reason as to where the ore was actually at. It was like plums in a plum pudding or raisins in raisin bread. It was distributed all throughout this altered andesite. So they would constantly have to drop shafts and have raises and winses and exploratories trying to find the rich ore bodies. Well, the CNC shaft was responsible for finding one of the largest bonanzas ore bodies that was ever recovered on the Comstock load. But I wanted you to see the size and scale of these mine dumps. This was all dug out by hand, okay? And this is one out of many mine dumps throughout the entire area. It just shows you how tough the men were back in the day to be able to work three to 4,000 feet underground in 130 degree temperatures and hauling out tons of ore per day for years. And here it is. These are the foundations to the great CNC shaft. Massive foundations for the pumps and the hoisting works. Just mind boggling. And there's all the mine dumps over there in the background of propolite, which is basically altered andesite. And there it is. That's the shaft, the main shaft to the CNC shaft. It's hard to tell, but that drops down 3,500 feet. Now everything's been pulled out and scrapped for the war effort during World War II. But there was a massive shaft here, three compartment, went down 3,500 feet. The mine dumps over here are absolutely mind boggling to think that they dug this out by hand. This is something that most people don't think about, but I do because I've worked in mines before, is that when it's super cold out, like it does get up here in Virginia City, and you're working down there where it's hot and humid, especially in the Comstock load, where it's 130 degree water coming out of those drill holes for the dynamite, you're working in your underwear, basically and you're sweating to death, and then you hop on the safety cage to go up to the surface, and it's freezing out here, you'll get pneumonia real fast. And a lot of the head frames weren't covered, and if they were, they had to remove it, because after the fire over at the Yellow Jacket mine, a law was passed stating that you couldn't have any type of structures over the head frame in case the fire came up the shaft and caught the head frame on fire. It wouldn't catch everything else on fire and burn down the rest of the town. So they took all the structures and buildings off of the head frame. So when you come up out of that shaft, it's freezing out here and you gotta hurry and get to the dry before you catch pneumonia. Now I've done lots of videos on Virginia City and I'm gonna leave a link right here to some of the best ones that I think that you'll enjoy. Go ahead and click it watch it guarantee you're gonna love it all right now we're gonna get on to what you've been waiting for that's right all that silver that we're gonna be giving away <laughs> i know you want to see that all right come here take a look at this now the moment you all been waiting for i know how do i get my hands on those silver bars well first of all let me tell you what kind of silver bars they are we've got commemorative silver bars that are still in the packaging they show a head frame and an ore car and a hoist house, and they got the state of Nevada emblem on there, 100 year commemorative. These are fantastic as collector editions. We got freshly poured one ounce bars. Oh, you can't beat that. Oh, look at this. We got three ounce shaped Nevada bars. Oh, you gotta look, oh, where's the, and look at this, a five ounce silver bar. Ooh, for you stackers, you gotta love that stuff. Mm, mm, mm. That's enough silver to choke a donkey. So how are we gonna give this all away? Well, we're gonna give it away to our premium patrons because it's just our way of saying thank you for helping us keep the dream alive. And if you wanna become a premium patron yourself, all you gotta do is look for the icon at the end of the video that looks like that. Just smash it, make a $10 pledge, and you become instantly qualified to get in on winning the silver. It doesn't get any easier than that. Not only that, but we got three day gold mining trips coming up here soon. Ooh, where they find phenomenal gold. Oh, and we just pulled a mess of gold out of the mine too. And we got specimen gold that we gave away too, and we're giving more away. And in fact, we're giving a drone away. We're just giving everything away. I must've lost my mind. So go ahead and click on that Patreon icon, make your $10 pledge, and we'll see you over at the site with these silver bars. So you know what I'm gonna say, huh? So come on, let's go!